Good morning, church. Today's scripture comes from Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 24 through 27. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain came and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Praise God for his word. How's it going? Good morning, Desert Breeze. How are y'all doing? Good? Awesome. I see some of you wearing hoodies and drinking warm drinks. It's kind of cold outside. It's raining. It's probably uh, my, one of my favorite things. My uh, mother-in-law visited yesterday briefly, and I uh, was just driving through, and uh, she's not from Phoenix, and <laughs> she's like, so it, it, it rains here. I'm like, Yeah. And we're good. I mean, it's going to rain a few days, and then, you know, we'll get six months of uh, not rain. So, you know, most of, most of, the, most of the year. But, uh, but it's good to uh, have you all here this morning. Um, I get the honor of starting off this new teaching series of the greatest story ever told. So go ahead and, and grab your notes. Um, as for in this weekend, we're going to be discussing why worldviews matter. So this, this topic, particularly when it comes to worldviews, and, um, is, gets me really excited. And the reason being is, at one point, I was um, thinking, I, or let me start over on that. Because of philosophy, it, it deals with this philosophical idea of your, these worldviews. And phil, uh, philosophy is thinking and considering these big, these big questions of life, existence, reason, morality, the, why we think or believe the way we do, and specifically the study of these world religions and, and how people come to believe what they believe. At one point, before I went and got a business degree, I was working on, I was going for uh, my bachelor's in philosophy and world religion, but I switched because I didn't want to struggle finding a job. <laughs> you know, I wanted, you know, maybe make a living. Yeah. However, I did learn that you don't need a degree to be a philosopher and then also a theologian. A philosopher, again, being someone who thinks and, and considers these big questions about life, existence, reason, morality, and then theology being taking that a step further. And how do those big questions relate to, to God, the existence of God, and our belief about God? So a goal today, one a goal today I have is that you all leave here knowing that you're philosophers and theologians. Everybody is a philosopher and theologian. I want you to leave here knowing that you are so you guys ready? Awesome. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for this awesome day that you've made. As we study your word and review this greatest story ever told, this you coming to earth to become like us so that we might know you. I just pray that you would uh, guide our hearts and our minds this morning. In your name, amen. The Bible is the greatest story ever told. It is a love story of creation, man's fall, but also God's glorious redemption and restoration. And at the center of that story is a baby, 
upon which everything would depend. And to the extent, at a fundamental level, that this love story shapes your worldview, that is, this, this, the observations and assumptions about this meaning of life, the universe and everything, that you, as it's shaped, you would find an unimaginable, satisfyingly full life, an unshakable faith that is only found in Christ. So, what is a worldview? How do we get, how do we allow ourselves to be shaped by a biblical worldview? See, everyone has a worldview. It's the, this, a worldview is the set of beliefs that determine how we live. It defines how we think about the world, about ourselves, and about others. It's how we interact. See, it is, it is the lens in which we look at everything, and you can't escape having a worldview. With every, but to be clear, so, and you're like, well, Russ, what is, what is my worldview? What do, how do I find out what my worldview is? Well, you, every worldview answers these seven questions that you have that I have written out for you. The first is, how did we get here? And this is our origin. Where did we come from? Primordial soup or a creator? Divine design or accident? So what you believe will define, your worldview will define this question. Another is why are we here? What is the meaning of life? What is our meaning? To just waste time until we die? Do we just not exist, born, live life, and then stop existing? And life is just this inconvenient time where we stop not existing? Or was there a plan before we were born? We have a reason to be here and a place we are going. Why are we here? Our meaning. And where are we going? What comes after this? What is our future and the afterlife? Who is in charge is another question. This answers the question of the existence of God, whether there is or there isn't. Who's in charge? Who makes the rules? What is true is the next one. What is true? This is the nature of truth and reality. Is it objective? Is it subjective? You know, what's true for you might not be true for me. It's, you know, live your own truth. So if you have a worldview, it answers that. Like, what is truth? In, in the kind of going back to who's in charge, who sets what's right and what's wrong? What is right and what's wrong? Morality. What's the, you know, who sets the standard for what's right and wrong? I mean, because if we, if you have the worldview that we came from nothing and we're going to nothing, then who cares? There's no reason to care. I heard someone say once that we're just wasting time until we die. Seems pretty pessimistic, very nihilistic. And then last is what is wrong with the world and how can it be put right? And this is, what is the problem? This answers the question of the problem and the solution. Because we can all feel it. Something's wrong. Everybody feels it. Whether you believe in God or not, everyone has this underlying thing. Otherwise, why would, they, why would there be any protesting at all? Why would anybody be fighting for... For, there's a sense, we have this sense of social justice or this justice. We, we all have it in, in, in us. Where does that come from? We know there's a problem. What is it? And then your worldview defines what the solution is. Is it, you know, making sure everyone's paid the same or is it 
or, you know, if, if there only there was no world hunger anymore, that would be, you know, that's the problem. Everyone needs a house over there, like a roof over their head. Make a living wage. Or is it the solution something else? See, if you're struggling to find what you believe or how, what your worldview is, you can answer these questions. Everyone, and everyone has an answer to them. Some people might even say, I don't know. You're like, is there a God? You're like, I don't know. I don't know. I'm like, cool. Even, and, and even if you're an agnostic and you're saying, I, you know, I just don't know, Russ. I don't know if there's a God. You know, there's no way to prove it or, or that. But your actions tell me if you believe in God or not. Your actions say, where did we, how did we get here? Where are we going? Who's in charge? See, you can answer, I don't know, to any of these. But how you act, how you spend your time, your talent, and your treasures in the world will tell me what your worldview is. See, so I have a, a story. Or I was, so I was watching a, a documentary recently on um, flat earthers. So people that, if you didn't know, there are people in the world that believe the earth is flat. It happens. I'm not, you know... People and choose to interpret some science a certain way and some others. However, in this, I thought it was really interesting is they, they, this group pooled their money together to get this, this high tech instrument that was going to measure if, that it was going to prove, definitively prove that the earth was flat. And so what they did was, what this instrument does is if the earth was a globe and actually spinning, there would be a drift on this instrument. And you see, like, well, if there's a certain percentage drift, then we would know that it's actually a globe. However, there won't be a drift, and this will definitively prove it. So they pulled their money together, tens of thousands of dollars. They get this, this instrument, and they look at it, they turn it on, and they wait. And it tilts. And their conclusion? We spent all this money and got a broken instrument. What? Oh, man, we spent all the money and it was broken. We got to pull our money and get a new instrument. The same thing happens in the world today with the Bible. They get the Bible. And like, this should show me how to live. I think I should live a certain way. Let's see what it says. They open it up and they're looking and they're like, yeah, it must be broken. It doesn't line up with the way I view the world. It's broken. It tells me to live one way, but I know in my heart What's true to me is to live this way. For this reason, you would think these people would, that believed in the flat earth, they would look and go like, oh, I have to reor like, reorganize my thoughts and my worldview in a way to align with reality. And with the Bible, it's the same thing. You're like, no, it's the true. If, if, you, if you say that it's true, you reorganize your thoughts and your actions according to it. And that's what a biblical worldview is. So, so why is a biblical worldview, like, why does that matter then? You know, because people, the flat earth, they, you know, they go off on their own lives and they continue to live. And for the most part, you probably wouldn't even know one. I happen to know somebody who is. I choose to not talk to him about it because it's kind of agree to disagree. But so, so why does this, why does this view matter? See, developing and applying a biblical worldview is an essential part to our lives as believers, our growth in godliness, and our spiritual maturity. Matthew, from our reading this morning, one verse, Matthew seven twenty four. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Having a biblical worldview is building your house on the rock, listening to the words of Christ and acting accordingly. Having a biblical world matters because it is needed to develop a foundation for lifelong faith in Christ. John 17, 3, now this is eternal life that you know God, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Who, who God has sent. 
And it's, this, is, this is the meaning of life, to know God. It is on that foundation. And when you have that foundation, like the wise man, when the storms came, you won't be shaken. When the world seems in chaos because you know something's wrong, you will stand fast. Next is it, it provides wisdom for life. Provide wis- it is needed to provide wisdom for life. Proverbs 2, 6, for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Psalm 19, 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing to the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. It is refreshing. When we make this, when we put our foundation in, we have, we can get through the storms with him. And it's not only that, it's refreshing to our souls. Next is it shapes our character and conduct by truth. It is needed to shape our character and conduct by truth. How we act. It tells us how to live our character and how to treat others. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture, all scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It tells us how to live and how to conduct ourselves with one another. It also protects us against counterfeit ideas, those things that sound good, that tickle our ear. We're like, oh yeah, that, wait, I mean that, I mean, did you hear what this guy said over here? I mean, we were talking, I was listening to this podcast and he just opened my mind and I'm like, did we know this, this stuff? And he's like, you know, the Bible is just so old, we can't believe it anymore. And really how you have to look at it is this way. How do you know that's not true? Well, by actually knowing it. And actually knowing it will protect us from counterfeit ideas. Colossians 2.8, see that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and elemental spiritual forces of, of this world rather than on Christ. That idea of, you know, I'm just, I'm not religious, I'm spiritual. Mm, kind of sounds made up. That's a nice thought. Pretty, you know, unicorns and fairies or whatever. But, we, but when you know the scripture, you are able to discern those counterfeit ideas. That doesn't seem right. How do you know? You're like looking at something, you're like, oh, you know, if you've ever held a counterfeit money and you pick it up, and you're like, I don't know. this doesn't feel right. Those who've worked in, in retail long enough or, or cash handling, you'll be like, you don't need to know what a counterfeit feels like, but you know what the real thing feels like. And so you grab it and you're like, yeah, I don't, I don't know, man, this doesn't feel right. And unfortunately, they have that marker. Well, with counterfeit, the best way to know what's real or to know, to spot the counterfeits, to protect it and against them, is to spend time with the real thing, spend time in the word. Next is it answers the big questions of life. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. For, the day of du- for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or or evil, everything will be exposed. So this is, why are we here? To fear God and keep his commandments. Fear being love and and, and following him. And, And where are we going? One day, we are held accountable for everything. Fortunately, we have Christ who pays that price for us of, of all our, of all our sin. And then but who's in charge? God. God brings every deed into judgment. And not judgment like the gap, like, ah, I'm giving judgment, but exposing, showing us what's going on. Exposing, even including every hidden thing, even the things that we've kept to ourselves forever. 
You think it's hidden, but it's not. And the last of these is it equips individuals for service to Christ. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. We have work to do, and he's given us the tools to do that work. So we understand why, why, why is this having it matter? See, we, we, it gives us the foundation. It gives us wisdom for life. tells us how to act, how to conduct, how to treat each other, how to protect from, false, from, from wrong ideas. helps us answer these questions. And it gives us the tools to do his work. If it does all these things and we read the Bible, why does there seem to be a disconnect? We feel, I mean, there's a disconnect. How is it possible that so many in our world can claim to be Christian, yet lack biblical consistency or a biblically consistent worldview? There was a study a friend of mine was sharing with me, and they found that 6% of confessing evangelical Christians had a completely biblical, consistent worldview. So in the reverse, 94% didn't. Complete, to be clear, completely consistent. Not just some consistent, but they got it all the way across with everything. And I think even I can slip on that. I think we all can. So we'll, we'll hold these five views, or, but we'll miss this one over here. Maybe the inerrancy of Scripture or who Jesus said he was, or any number of things. So how is that possible for somebody to not have this consistent worldview? Well, they lack knowledge or reject parts of what the Bible says. They just don't know what it says. The easiest way to get parts of the Bible wrong is to not know what it says to begin with. Or, like, like the flat earth community that was looking at that tool, you're like, ah, it must be broken in this part. Oh, you know, it was really old. It was written so long ago, it doesn't completely apply to everything today. They didn't know about the things we know. It's called chronological snobberies, where you look at the past and go, glad they're dumb because, you know, they lived a long time ago. They must be dumb. They're not as smart as us. We have smartphones. See, smart, it's in the name. Romans, Romans 1.25, they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worship and serve created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. See, people don't, they either don't know what it says or they like to pick and they choose what they want to believe. Say, I believe in Jesus. He was a good and moral teacher. And, you know, the things he talked about was a good way to live. I'm, I'm sorry, he didn't give you that choice. Jesus claimed to be God. And so there's three things that you can come from that. He's either God, he is the Lord, or he's lying, or he's a lunatic. And there's no other choice in there. And they go backwards. He's a lunatic, a liar, or he is actually the Lord. And so to say he's a good teacher makes you a fool. Because you're believing either a liar or a lunatic. So he doesn't, he doesn't give us that choice. Or another reason for the disconnect is we, we are, people are overly concerned with what others think instead of what God thinks. They say, I don't want to be seen as intolerant. I want people to look at me and say, oh, that guy is such, he's, he's, they're good. I like them. They love people and they care for them. 
You don't want to be seen as intolerant in our world today. I had a Christian, friend's, uh, fr- Christian friend once tell me that they wished that Christians would be as loving and accepting as those that they knew in the LBGT community. My friend had a point. It does appear that they're more loving and accepting of everyone. And as Christians, we need to do a better job also at loving people. For all are image bearers of God. But why do we love others? So they see us as loving? Do you care more about being seen as a loving and tolerant person? Or what God calls you to do, which is to love others? Because it looks the same. From the outside, they both look the same. To be, well, I care more about people seeing me as loving and tolerant, or am I loving others because God called me to love others? See, first we are called to love God, and then out of our love for God, we love others. Love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. They go together, and it's in that order. We love God and then love others. But what does it mean to love God? 1 John 5, 3. For this is, for this is love for God, to keep his commands. It's one thing to love. It's another thing to be complicit in allowing sin. See, during his ministry, Jesus got a bad rap for hanging out with sinners. But he didn't tell those people that he was spending time with, you know, you do you, live your own truth. He said, you are forgiven, go and sin no more. Jesus, one, didn't care about what the Pharisees, the religious right, the the people on one side thought of him. And he, and he said, you know what, I, you know, I only care, it's only my relationship with the Father. But at the same time, those who are on the other spectrum, he also didn't, he's like, no, but this is still the truth. And it's still about his relationship with his Father. That's what we're, when we, when we want to be like Christ and, and be, like that, it's, it's, we're caring about our relationship with him and the Father. It's not about what others think of us. Another thing in that list is how is it possible to be, have this disconnect is that they have a lukewarm commitment to Christ. They have a lukewarm commitment to Christ. Revelations th- Revelation 3.15 I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. This is Jesus talking to one of the churches in Revelation. Man, I don't want to hear that from him. I would rather say, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. I wish you were at least, I mean, pick one, dude. Either follow me or don't. Don't ride the fence. See, when you think about it, you're like, "Ah, Russ, I'm not, you know, I'm not lukewarm or, you know, I'm here. But do you have friends who aren't, you aren't Christian around? I mean, I do get it. I work, you know, I have a regular job and I work around a lot of people who aren't Christians. And for that reason, I have to be careful with what I say. But there's a difference between guarding your speech in certain circumstances and joining in on the folly. There's, there's I mean, you know it. It's, it's not just chuckling maybe. You're like, oh, that caught you off guard and you kind of chuckled at the crass joke. But rather, oh, no, no, and then one-upping it, adding another one in, joining in. See, when you look at, uh, when you're living through life, is someone going to go, hey, because you might not be able to say anything in, your, in the workplace, but when they find out, which is inevitable, they're a Christian, they're like, like, John's a Christian? I, really? I had no idea. You wouldn't have known. Or, oh, that makes sense. 
Yeah, story checks out. That, yeah, that totally, yeah, that, that's right. That's what I would expect. I'd expect a Christian in, in the best way possible. Like, you know what? They, they're, they are a kind and loving person. That is what I thought Christians should be like. So when you think about it, that 94% doesn't seem too far away. That 94% people aren't completely in line. It makes sense because we all have that tendency. It's sin. Which brings us to like how, they, how our worldviews change. So we might get a biblical worldview and then it drifts, or we might not have one at all and it's time to, re, to align. So can worldviews change? Yes. Good news, they can. So despite our best efforts though, due to our sin, our worldview can get misaligned and disconnected from the truth. It's sin. That's, I mean, it makes sense. We're sinful creatures, so for 94% to not be perfect, yeah. Shocker, I would expect it to be lower. It just means 6% were on their A game that day. They must've just gotten right out of class or seminary or something and they knew all the right answers. But ultimately, if you look at our lives, 94% seems pretty generous. Or, or 6%, rather, seems really generous. See, to have a consistently biblical worldview, you must go back to the Bible and take hold of its promises God made to us, for the world offers us nothing. See, the answer is to go back. So I want you to grab your pens for me. I know all the blanks are, should be filled in by now. So I want you to underline, go back to the Bible. See, this is a repeated action. This isn't a, I went back, I read it, or, I, I, you know, I read the Bible. No, you go back to it. And then when you're back there, in order to keep it, you take hold. Underline, take hold. You have to grab it. You grip it hard. G grab hold of these promises for God. Why? Because everything else is empty. Because the world offers us nothing. See, we, we answer these questions. What is our worldview? And, and, this, and the, your biblical worldview should answer these questions. So it's more of a gauge. We understand why it's important. Because it's, it's the foundation. But too often we're looking at this. We, we find that we're not, the storms wreck us sometimes. We get into life and we get destroyed and beaten. But what do you do? That's, that's showing there's, there's a disconnect. How do you recover? You go back. You go back, repeated action. You go back to God's promises. You, you take hold of them. You go back to the scripture. You go back to his promises. Because in the end, the world offers nothing. There's nothing else. Everything else will come up empty. Um, three month, uh, th about three months ago, actually, I think it was three months ago this weekend, we were going through the, the rest series from burnout to balance. And um, in, the, in the teaching, do what matters most, we, we talked about the five G's that we have here at Desert Breeze. And we can go through, um, I recommend just going and listening if you're not familiar with those, we cover them. However, specifically the first and the second. So the first one was a genuine Christian. So a genuine change. The second was growing. And this growing is where it happens. That's where we, we're, we're taking hold of, we're taking, we're going back to the Bible and taking hold because the world offers us nothing. See, a growing Christian is committed to disciplines necessary for spiritual growth. That's, that's attending weekend services, which you all did. Good, good job. Check. Not that, that would check the box. I mean, yeah, I showed up. Um, Second one was we had was, was joining a small group. It's not just, it, it's spending time with other believers. See, and then next is, is personal Bible study and prayer, reading the Bible. See, you can only survive. How, what's the best way to, when, when you get off course, which is inevitable, we all get distracted. When you have that person come alongside and you're like, hey, Russ, what you said there, dude, I don't think that's in the Bible. I'm like, it is? I think it is. I was reading it here. I'm like, and then go and look, oh, I completely misread that or misremembered or, but it, it takes people around us to be able to call us out. And then also, in order to know it, you have to read it. I can kind of sum it up this way. The best way to protect ourselves and keep in a biblical worldview 
is to hang out with Jesus and his followers. And why? Because the world offers us nothing real. Personal time in prayer in the Bible is time with Jesus. And then is spending time with his followers is here and during the week and, and having those, those Christian brothers and sisters around you. So what is, so that's how to keep a, a worldview, how to, how to get it and to keep it. But what is it? What is this worldview? And that's, that's actually what we're going to be talking over in these next, the next four weeks in this series. We're going to be breaking down these points. But you have it in your notes there, and it's that first one is creation, a purpose. In a biblical worldview, we know that our purpose is to know God and to make him known. To know God and to make him known. There's a problem that we talked about. We all know there's a problem with the world, and the problem is sin. And ultimately, sin is the belief that God is holding out on us. God's holding out on us. That's why he doesn't want me to be happy. And I know better than the most powerful being in the universe, outside of the universe. The one who created the universe, I know better. My extensive, you know, 40 plus years of life have gotten me there. God's holding out on me. And then Jesus is the solution. And that is, he lived a life we should have lived and died a death we should have died. He paid the price for the sin. We've sinned and we're doing our own way and it separated us from God. And only belief in him is the answer. That's the solution. That's the answer to life. And then in, in that series, we also cover a future, the restoration. What does the future hold for us? A new heaven, a new earth, and all that good stuff. So I hope today you can leave here knowing, now you know, you can all leave here knowing that you are philosophers and theologians. Give your hand. Up. There you go. Good job. You're all, theolo you know, you're all philosophers and theologians. That said, I have one last point, which means we got like another 20 minutes. You don't believe me? I have multiple pages left. Just, yeah, like father, like son. Apple doesn't fall from the tree. Some might be thinking, Russ, that was good info. Thanks for helping me figure out my worldview and align it biblically. Some of you might just be checking out this Christian thing or might be claim to be Christian and, and, and you're not quite ready to give up that one thing that's left. You're just kind of hanging on to that, spending time with non-Christians. They're like, oh no, I'm just, you know, they're my, you know, you're not quite, you know, Christian around them. I have a verse I want to share with you. 2 Corinthians 2, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians 6, 1 through 2. Paul is writing to the church in Corinth. Working with him, that is God, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. In a favorable time, I listened to you. And then Paul quotes Isaiah in a favorable time, I listened to you. In a day of salvation, I have helped. He was referring to a future time. And then Paul says, behold, now is a favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Do not receive the, he starts with, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. So we read this morning, the scripture covered these two men. One built his house on the rock and the other on sand. They both heard. They both received the grace of God. They both heard the good news. However, one was in vain. They did not act. The other acted. And they withstood the storms of life. And they had a foundation and a love for Christ. And then when, when Paul is quoting Isaiah, he is saying, and Isaiah was looking towards the future, a future time, the day of salvation, it's coming. And then he tells the church of Corinth, behold, it is a favorable time. Now is a favorable time. 
Now is the day of salvation. Today. Today is the day. We covered what is the, we, we talked about, it's like we asked that question, what is the problem and what is the solution? The problem is we are. We're sinful. We're living as our own gods. And it'll always come up empty. When the storms come, we will get washed away. The solution is living in the reality that Christ fixed our relationship with God. He restored it. And accepting him truly as your savior and following him, following him is the only way. Today is the day. Do not receive the grace of God in vain. Today is the day. The new year's coming. It's common. Common thing we do is we, during the new year, we have a resolution. It's less than 30 days away. That's not the day. Today is the day. Today is the day. I don't, it's literally the most important thing you'll ever hear. Today is the day. Do not wait. Do not hear this and not act. You're on the fence. I'm telling you, today is the day. If you have any questions about what I talked about today, come talk to me. Or one of the leaders up here would love to pray with you. But I'm just telling you, today's the day. Don't, don't wait. Don't receive the grace of God in vain. He is the only solution. That is what a biblical worldview is. It's looking at everything through that. Let's pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, thank you. We, we ask you to shape our worldviews to be conformed to the truth of your word, to your truth, not our own, helping us to find the promised, unimaginably satisfyingly full life in an unshakable faith that can only be found in you, that you, you, are, you are the solution to our world. We know something's wrong, and you're the solution. We thank you that today is the day of salvation, and we worship you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good week.